Hello, AP Chemistry students. How are you? Hey, uh, we are almost through the school year. It's pretty exciting, uh, but still a few more units to go through. So today I'm going to talk about Chapter 7. This is the no cal practice. As always, I would suggest just sort of scrolling through to the questions that you still have questions about. And just because I said it doesn't mean it's any more clear. So don't hesitate to ask me for further clarification. All right, so let's get started. So number one. Uh, number one, it says the first ionization energy of magnesium is 738. A good estimate for the second ionization of magnesium is what? So first of all, as you go from the first to the second to the third ionization, uh, the numbers keep getting bigger. It keeps getting harder and harder and harder to remove electrons. So, um, and I would say a good estimate is that if um, the electrons you're removing are in the same energy level, then basically the ionization energy roughly doubles or a little less than doubles. Okay. So that being said for magnesium, uh, of course, it's got the noble gas above, which is um, neon. Okay. And then the electron configuration is 3s2. So magnesium has two valence electrons. So you get rid of the first electron and then you get rid of the second. That's going to be the second one in the S sub level. And the ionization energy is roughly going to double. So I would say the best answer looks like it's going to be letter C. Okay, uh, that looks good. Uh, just an FYI that once you get rid of the first electron, fine. Once you get rid of the second electron, ionization energy is roughly going to double. Once you get rid of the third electron, that means these guys are gone. You're going to start digging into the noble gas core, energy levels that are much closer to the nucleus, and that's going to get a lot harder. So that's when you're going to see more of like a times five or more increase in ionization energy. So that would be what D is. That would imply that might be the ionization energy for the third electron being removed. Okay, so hopefully that helps. All right, rolling right along. Let's see what we got next. So this one um, is also about ionization energy. And it says, which one of these explanations uh, explains why, as you go across the first period of the, of the periodic table, why does ionization energy increase? And as you see, if you start with lithium way on the left, all, all the way to neon, it does increase as you go across. Okay, and the funny thing about this one is that all the choices, they sound pretty good. So you really have to look for the one that actually explains why it gets harder and harder to remove electrons. Uh, so A is true. You know, as the atomic number increases, the electrons are harder to remove, but that doesn't really tell me why. Okay, so I think we can do better. B, ionization energy increases as atomic uh, number increases in a period. Um, and that's true, but that's kind of like a definition. Okay, so it doesn't really tell me why. As the atomic number increases, more electrons are added, thus increasing electron-electron repulsion. Um, does it, it's true, but it doesn't really explain why it gets harder and harder to move electrons. So let's look at letter D. It says, as the atomic number increases, more protons in the nucleus cause an increase in effective nuclear charge, making it harder to move electrons. Boom, that is our best answer. Okay, so as you go across a period, a row on the periodic table, you keep adding one more proton, one more proton, one more proton. That's called the effective nuclear charge, or sometimes just nuclear charge. That is what can pull the electrons in tighter and tighter and tighter, and therefore it gets harder and harder and harder to remove those electrons. So that, my friends, is definitely the best answer. All right, let's see what we got on the next page here. So number three, now we're dealing with exceptions. So it says, what is the best explanation for the decrease in the first ionization energy as you go from beryllium to boron? Okay, so I already wrote the electron configurations for beryllium. Okay, helium is a noble gas and it's 2s2. So you basically have um, just the S subshell filled, one electron up, one electron down. Uh, for boron, of course, you got one additional electron. So 2s2, 2p1. So the electron configuration looks like that. So the basic question is, why is it unusually easy to get rid of that electron? Because keep in mind, as you go to boron, you have added one more proton. So the nuclear charge is greater. So the trend would suggest that that electron would be held more tightly and the ionization energy would be greater, but it's actually less. Okay, so if you remember from class, um, this really boils down to sort of the shape of where this electron is being removed. So when you remove this electron from beryllium, that's in the 2s, whoops, that is a 2s subshell, which is spherical. So the nucleus is like right there, okay? And you got the spherical shape. 
when you remove uh, the first electron from boron, it's actually in this p sublevel, and p orbitals have that dumbbell shape, and here's the nucleus. Okay, so the take home message is that one thing we talked about in class is that when you have that spherical shape, the electron density is much more likely to be close to the nucleus. Okay, and according to Coulomb's law, that's going to be a stronger pull. So we want to pick the choice that sort of alludes to that. So I would say the best answer is definitely D. The electrons in beryllium are located in the 2s subshell. These electrons penetrate closer to the nucleus because of the spherical shape than the 2p electrons that are in the dumbbell shape. Okay, so that's the correct answer, but just to make sure, let's quickly go through the other ones. Um, A, moving from beryllium to boron, more electrons are added, thus increasing electron-electron repulsion. Okay, really doesn't have to do with ionization energy. Moving from beryllium to boron, more protons in the uh, nucleus attract the valence electrons, making it harder to remove electrons. That explains sort of the normal trend, but we're seeing the opposite of that. We're seeing it easier to remove that electron. Uh, C, the electron and beryllium are being removed from full subshells, which is more stable than the half-filled subshell in B. Okay, and mm, that sounds good. That might be a contributing factor, but bottom line, if you can bring it back to Coulomb's law, Okay, um, meaning dealing with the attractions from the nucleus and the size of the charges, that's always going to be a stronger answer. Okay, so being that this is, um, you know, because of the spherical shape, uh, the electrons can feel the pull from the nucleus, that's a Coulomb's law answer. Okay, so D would be the best answer. Good. All righty, let's go on to number four. This is looking at the other exception when it comes to ionization energy. So it says, what is the best explanation for the decrease in ionization energy from N to O? So just to go back, because you had a nice drawing, um, like number two here, you can actually see those uh, exceptions that these two questions are asking about. So there's how boron is unusually low, unusually easy to remove that electron. And same thing with oxygen, okay? Like those two guys dip down, and that's why they're exceptions. All right, so why would we explain that one? So again, go back to the electron configurations. Here's nitrogen, okay? So it's got five valence electrons, so 2s2... Uh, to P3. So if I fill those in, I fill the S first, and then I keep the 2P electrons spread out, looks something like that. Now for oxygen, 2S2, 2P4, so you've added one additional electron. So we got our three, and then we're going to double up uh, to accommodate that fourth electron in the 2P subshell. Okay, so again, the basic question is, why is it unusually easy to get rid of this electron as compared to this electron? Okay, so, and it comes down to this, that when you go ahead and double up those electrons in that orbital, uh, that increases electron-electron repulsion. And you know what? If by removing that electron, um, it, you reduce that electron-electron repulsion, so that's stabilizing, okay? So that's your general reason. So let's see if we can pick out which choice talks about that, okay? Um, so I think the best answer is letter C. It says the electrons in nitrogen occupy the 2P orbital singularly, meaning unpaired, 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 whereas the electrons in one of the 2p orbitals of oxygen are paired, which is this guy, thus resulting in electron-electron repulsion, okay? So I think that's the best answer, but real quickly, we'll talk about the other ones. Uh, the oxygen atom is smaller, thus making it easier to remove electrons compared to nitrogen. That's totally wrong. That's backwards. Uh, the electrons in nitrogen are being removed from half-filled subshells, which is more stable than partially filled. So we came back to that, and that, you know, it sounds good, but it just is not tied to Coulomb's law, okay? It's not tied to charges tracking or repelling. Uh, so finally, D, moving from nitrogen to oxygen, there are more protons in the nucleus, which is true, thus increasing the effect of nuclear charge, which is true. Uh, Z, we used to call that ZEF right there, but it stands for Z. EFF like that. Um, that's just a that that is a symbol for effective nuclear charge. Um, we don't we don't really have to worry about it, but just so you recognize it, it's basically just talking about the pull from the nucleus. Okay, the protons from the nucleus. Uh, so if you yes, by adding more protons, you increase the effective nuclear charge, causing a greater amount of attraction for the valence electrons, making it harder to remove the electrons. So that's that's the trend. Okay, that's what you'd expect for oxygen. Okay, that it would have a higher ionization energy, but because of reducing the electron-electron repulsion, it's actually lower. So that does not explain the exception. All right, so C is the best answer. So I would say, uh, you know, these these are basically the two big exceptions that we talked about with the trends, um, and you want to know them. 
Okay. And keep in mind that it's for, you know, the family where, where boron is, but it also could be applied to anybody in the entire family, the entire column. Okay. So like aluminum, gallium down the line and same thing with nitrogen to oxygen. So oxygen is where the exception is, but sulfur, selenium, tellurium, all the way down that column might see a similar phenomenon. Okay. All right. So those are those exceptions. Good. Let's move along. Okay, so let's see, still talking about ionization energy. Uh, it says here, this table shows the first ionization energies of element X in kilojoules per mole. So you got the first one, the second, and the third ionization energy. What is the likely formula for a compound between element X, okay, which, which is here, and element Y, which is a halogen? So the halogens uh, are in family 17 on the periodic table. So that's your fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide, okay? Um, the second from last column on the periodic table, okay? And X, well, let's see here. Based on ionization energies, okay, so I see the first one, okay? I see the second one, it roughly doubled, okay? So that kind of implies that they're in the same energy level, the electrons are removed. But here we see a big jump, okay? So what that implies to me is that this element X has two valence electrons, and that does look like a smiley face, I see. Okay, two valence electrons. And then when you try to pull out the third, this guy right here, that's why it takes so much energy because it's in the energy level closer to the nucleus. So long story short, um, this is something like magnesium, you could say, okay, or any metal that has two valence electrons. So next question I have, if this is magnesium, okay, it's a metal from the second column of the periodic table. And uh, Y is a halogen, okay, which is a nonmetal this is gonna be an ionic compound. Okay, so now I just need to balance it out. So assuming this is a plus two charge like magnesium, okay, cause it's gonna lose those two valence and halogens take on a minus one charge, you would need two Ys, okay, to make a balanced ionic compound. So I would say the best answer is letter B. All right, so that was kind of fun, okay. Uh, let's see, what's next, number six. So it says, which orbital notation diagram shows an electron in the excited state? So excited is opposite of ground. So ground means you fill the orbitals, filling the lowest energy orbitals first, and then going to the next sublevel, and then going to the next sublevel. So an excited state is when an electron uh, isn't in the ground state and basically gets excited to a higher energy uh, sublevel. Okay. So let's see, 1s2, I mean, Looking at letter A, there's an electron in 1s that would, that's like hydrogen. That would be what you would expect. But B looks a little weird to me. And I think that's our answer because if you were to put the electrons uh, filling the lowest energy orbitals first, it would be, um, let me draw that a little clearer. If I use these boxes, it would be 1s and you'd have to fill it before you went to 2s. Okay, so what happened here is that this electron, it must have gained energy from maybe like a flame or electricity, and it got promoted, okay, and jumped up here. So that's an excited state, okay, because it didn't fill the lowest energy orbitals first. Okay, so B is the answer. Uh, there's really nothing, you know, C, once you get to the 2P sublevel, you remember you want to keep them unpaired before you pair them up, so that's totally what's expected. And D, I guess, would be... Uh, basically a noble gas. It has all the sublevels filled. Okay. So in fact, um, if you look that up on your periodic table, that would be neon. Okay. So B is the correct answer. All right. Um, let's see. Seven, we're going to start looking at periodic trends. It says when placed in order of increasing atomic radii, what is the correct order for the elements, aluminum, calcium, and magnesium? Okay. So I'm going to take a look at that periodic table. So let's say we had magnesium, calcium, and aluminum. So those are three players right there. And it said, put them in order of increasing size. So smallest one first to largest. Okay. Well, I would say that, you know, these two guys are in the, they have three energy levels, but this guy, calcium has four. So calcium without a doubt is going to be largest. Okay. Cause having four energy levels is always for the most part going to be bigger than something with three energy levels. And then looking between magnesium and aluminum, if you remember, as you go across the periodic table, you keep adding one more proton. Okay, so you increase the nuclear charge, which pulls the electrons in closer. So size decreases going across. So aluminum is going to be smaller than magnesium. 
So put in proper order, it would go aluminum is the smallest, followed by magnesium, and then calcium is the biggest. Okay, so we'll go back to our choices, and hopefully that's one of them. Okay, so aluminum, magnesium, calcium. Is that what I said? Yep. So it looks like A is the correct answer. I have to admit that when I did this practice, I actually got that one wrong because I put it in the opposite order. Okay, I put it in um, decreasing order. Okay, so you want to start with smallest and go to the biggest. Okay, so that's a little bit about periodic trends um, or atomic radii. Now, number eight. Which of the following electron arrangements show a violation of the orbital notation of electron configurations? So something, this, one of these electron configurations is wrong. Okay, so again, this would be hydrogen. It looks pretty good. This would be um, lithium. 1s2, 2s1. Looks pretty good. Um, this one, 1s2, 2s2. Uh-oh, I see a problem. So when you get to the 2p sublevel, you want to keep them um, unpaired before you pair them up. So it should be like this instead. Okay, and then D again is neon, as we talked about a minute ago. So it looks like C, um, that's a violation. Okay, it's not following Hun's rule where you keep them unpaired before you pair them up. Good. Okay, so number nine it says the reactivity of the alkali metals increases going down the group. What's a correct explanation for that? So looking at the periodic table, uh, basically as you go down a family, or as you go down the alkali metals, they get more reactive. Okay. So like francium is the most reactive alkali metal. Okay. And coincidentally, as it, the other, that's the most reactive family on the periodic table. The second or equally reactive, I guess you could say, are the halogens. Okay. And they're equally reactive, but their reactivity is opposite. It increases going up the column. Okay. So fluorine is the most reactive halogen. Okay. Kind of for the same reasons, but opposite. For the, the alkali metals, remember, um, they have one valence electron. And guess what they really want to do with that one valence electron? They want to get rid of it, okay? And in fact, uh, because, um, you know, as you go across the periodic table, um, size gets smaller and ionization energy gets greater, these guys do not hold on to that valence electron very tightly, okay? There's not a lot of nuclear charge pulling on it. So therefore, uh, it's pretty easy to remove. And in fact, as you go down the periodic table, it gets easier and easier and easier to remove that electron. So that's because francium's valence electron is so easy to remove because its ionization is so low, its electron is held so loose, that's what makes it have such a fast reaction rate, okay? So let's see if we can figure out which choice sort of says that. And I think the best answer is, uh, I think it's letter A. The ionization energy decreases as you move down the group, thus it requires less energy to remove the valence electron, and it results in greater reactivity, basically a faster reaction rate. Okay? Um, I think all the other choices more or less say the opposite thing or something that's unrelated. Okay? So A is the best answer. Again, though, tying it back to the halogens, um, their story is exactly the same but opposite. Remember, um, basically, fluorine, all the halogens want to gain an electron, but fluorine, being the smallest, its nuclear charge can pull on its electrons the best, and it can draw in that additional electron the best. Okay, so that's what makes uh, fluorine most reactive out of the halogens. All right, good. Let's see. Moving right along. Number 10 says, in which of the following electron transitions for hydrogen atoms is the greatest amount of energy emitted. And emitted is a really important word because emitted means that energy is released, okay? Which implies that you're falling from high energy to low. So my point is that C and D are off the table because they both involve jumping up to higher energy levels. That would require an addition of energy. So A and B are on the table, okay? And I would say, you know, if you think about your energy levels, see first energy level, second, these, wow, the, these are really pretty circles. Okay, so those are my shells. Sorry, they're so awesome looking. Okay, but I did want to make a point, okay, that when you go from five to two, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yep. So five down to two, the fifth energy level down to the second would look like that. Okay, and then four to three would look something like that. Okay, so the bigger the jump or the fall, the more energy that's emitted. Okay, so this guy would release a more energetic photon, shorter wavelength, higher frequency. 
Okay, so I would say that A is the winner. Now, <laughs> boy, oh boy, I really didn't showcase it this well, but I did want to show you something. So I'm actually going to try to draw it one more time. So there's my first energy level. We'll say this is a nucleus. Okay. There's my next energy level. There's my next. Now I'm drawing it on purpose this way. And then my next one, what do you guys notice happening to the energy levels? They do actually get closer and closer together. So if I asked you to compare like two down to one, okay, versus three down to two, you might say, oh yeah, they both involve just one level energy drops. But as you can see, one, two going down to one is a much more energetic, higher energy photon than three going down to two, okay? Because three going to, down to two, the energy levels are closer. So that's going to be not as energetic of a photon, okay? Just a little FYI. All right, we good? Let's see, moving on. How about number 11? This one's kind of tricky. It says element X has a ground state valence electron configuration of N, S2, and P5. Okay, so first of all, what does that mean? Remember, N can be like any energy level. So it could be in the fifth energy level, the fourth energy level. But what's important here is that you got two electrons here, five electrons here. That's a total of seven. So basically, it's something with seven valence electrons. So this could be anything, uh, again, from the halogens. So it could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide, any one of those. Okay, so it's basically saying element X is a halogen. The formula for the compound composed of element X and nitrogen would be Okay, so bottom line is if you put nitrogen um, nitrogen with a halogen, those are both nonmetals, okay? So they're both nonmetals. So this is going to be a covalently bonded molecule, okay? So that being said, uh, you kind of got to go back to what covalent bonds are, okay? So I'm going to actually start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. I'm trying to, let me try to make these um, dots a little bit better here. Or a little, little dashes instead. Pretend those are electrons. So there's nitrogen's five valence. Okay, so if I put it with um, a halogen, halogen has seven valence. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So guess what? These two lonely electrons will pair up and make a bond. Okay, and same thing here. Nitrogen has three lonelies. So it's going to want to bind with three halogens like so. Okay, so guess what? Uh, to make this compound right, okay, whoops, that's X, you basically have three nitrogen with three bonds, okay? So NX3 would be the best answer. And that's just because you're not balancing out charges or anything. It's just covalent bonding, okay? So you just want to pair up any unpaired electrons and make covalent bonds, okay? So there you go. That's a good one. Um, let's see, number 12. So this one, back to ionization energy, but this time we're looking at ions. Okay, so you got oxygen, oxygen plus, and oxygen minus. So the one thing all these have in common is the same nuclear charge, right? Because they all have the same number of protons. Okay, so they all have the same pull from the nucleus. It's just when you look at these, let's see, you got O, O plus, and O minus. You got eight protons in all of them, okay? But this is eight protons with eight electrons, eight protons with seven electrons, because you lost one, and then eight protons with nine electrons, okay? So uh, bottom line is the proton pole is exactly the same, um, but uh, let's see, you know, which one has the best proton to electron ratio? So eight protons can pull best on seven electrons right? Uh, versus eight protons pulling on nine electrons. This one has a lot more electron-electron repulsion. Okay. So um, that's, it's going to be a little easier to remove those electrons. Okay. So I would say the best order is going to be letter C. So it says increasing ionization energy. Okay. So actually, I totally had that backwards, didn't I? So I'm actually going to go with letter D. Okay. So this electron right here, from O minus would be easiest to remove to reduce that electron-electron pair repulsion. This guy would be in the middle, and this guy would be hardest because you have the same protons pulling on less electrons. Okay, so it's going to be harder. 
Okay, so I think that looks good. All right, so that was number 12. Um, so it has to do with um, ionization energy or atomic radii would be the same phenomena, but with um, ion charges. Okay, so this one, whew, big data table. So basically it says you got the first eight ionization energies for these four elements. Okay, and it said based on the data, which elements would most likely have similar chemical properties. Okay, similar chemical properties means basically same number of valence electrons. Okay, uh, so basically you're looking for elements that are in the same column on the periodic table. So to determine the number of valence electrons, I'm looking for the big gaps. So for um, letter W, let's see, roughly doubles, roughly doubles, roughly doubles or less, roughly doubles or less, doubles or less, but whoa, big jump. Okay, so this guy has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Okay, uh, look at element X. Let's see, roughly doubles or less, doubles or less, doubles or less, doubles or less, doubles or less. Oh, big jump. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, so far, X and Y, or W and X, sorry, uh, those two both have six valence electrons. It's probably like oxygen and sulfur, something like that. Um, so, that's your answer, but just for the fun of it, Y. Well, it looks like um, going from 578 to 1800, roughly doubling, roughly doubling. Whoop, looks like there's my big jump. So this guy has three valence electrons. And then this one, 496 to 4000, that's your big jump right there. So this guy has one valence electron. Okay, so like I said, with successive ionization energies, you can figure out how many valence electrons. All right, so that was number 13. And then number 14. Okay, so I told you in class you didn't have to worry too much about exceptions, but it's good to know that they do exist. It says the expected electron configuration for copper should be 4s2, 3d9. It's exactly what the periodic table would say. However, copper's electron configuration is actually 4s1, 3d10. Which of the following provides experimental evidence of this? And the best answer is letter C. It says the photoelectron spectroscopy spectrum for copper shows the relative number of numbers of electrons in each sublevel. Okay. And basically, you know, if this was your answer, okay, then you'd have like your um, 4S peak. Okay. And then you'd have your 4D peak. We'll say it looks like this, sorry, 3D. Okay. But then if this is what it actually looks like, what you'd really see, okay, is that this guy would be half as tall, right? And this guy would be just a skosh taller. Okay, so that's what would tell you that, hey, wait a second, you know, the electron configuration is not what I thought it is. Okay, so I think D is definitely the best answer there. Okay, um, the rest of them, they sound good, but like A, the mass spectrum of copper shows different isotopes. It has nothing to do with electron configurations. B, copper ions in solution have color. Okay, well, I mean, copper does have color. Okay, but I think both these would actually have color. I'm not sure that's the best evidence. Um, copper has the ability to form cations of plus one and plus two, whereas other transition metals, boy, I just think there's way too many exceptions in the uh, transition metal block. Don't know if that's the most convincing argument. So um, PES is definitely the way to go there. All right, let's see what else we got. So now, speaking of PES, the next couple of questions have to do with that. So this one, folks, I mean, anytime I do one of these problems, I just go ahead and sort of label what we're looking at here. So remember, um, the energy increases this way, okay? So this right here will always be the peak that has electrons that are hardest to remove. That means closest to the nucleus, okay? So if you're kind of looking at your typical atom, that this peak right here, the one that's most energetic, that's coming from the first energy level. So that's 1s2, okay, and then along the line, 2s2, 2p6, just going in order here, right? And then 3s2, 3p6, um, and then 3d10, right? Because that one gets even bigger. So now we are in the fourth sub, uh, fourth energy level, okay? So what sublevels do we have here? Definitely 4s2, okay? And this guy, okay, that's the most important part, actually. This guy is the same height as this guy, so that means they must be representing the same number of electrons. So what sublevels next is 4p, and since they're the same height, it's 4p2. 
Okay, so 4P2, that would correspond to germanium. So D is your answer, okay? And I would do the same thing with 16. Okay, so 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, right? Not very neat to, okay? And then um, 3S2, 3P6, because it's the same height as that one. And then, oop, you got this little nublet. So we're definitely into 4, right? And it's only one tall. So it looks like 4S1. Okay, so that would be potassium. And bing, bam, boom. Pretty easy, right? Okay, so just remember the height of the peak represents how many electrons have that binding energy. So that guy is half the height of these guys. So that's one electron versus two. All right, 17, it says an ele electron's complete photoelectron spectroscopy emission spectra shows five distinct peaks. What element could this be? Well, honestly, since, you know, all these uh, PES, they're pretty similar, right? Until you get to the part where they're different, like the valence electrons. So I'm just going to use this one. So first peak, second peak, third peak, fourth peak, fifth peak. So basically, we're looking for an element that is someplace in the 3P area. So I look on my periodic table, okay, and I'm looking for 3P. So here's um, the first row of the periodic table, second row of the periodic table, third row of the periodic table has, is in the third energy level, so that's what I'm looking at. This is the S block. This is the P block. So I need, my basically, my answer is one of those, okay? So I come back. And which choice is there? Okay, it looks like the answer would be sulfur. Okay. All right, 18, pretty similar. It says, how many distinct peaks does the photoelectron spectroscopy for tungsten have? Oh, good Lord. So we're going to have to map out uh, basically that entire thing. So let's do that real quick. Give ourselves a little space. Okay, so what? We got 74 electrons to accommodate. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. Okay, so we finally got into that area. Okay, and then, whoops, that goes back up to 4p. Okay, 4p6. So, so far, okay, and if we look at the periodic table, almost there. Let me clean this up a little bit. Whoops, 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 whoops. So tungsten is, in fact, right there. Um, where to go? Yep. It's number 74. Okay. So I had gotten us all the way. Um, what? I guess I should just rewrite it. 1s2, 2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. So I'm like right here. 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. Getting closer. So now I'm in this row. 5s2, Okay, and then you go one below, 4D10, Whew. all the way over here, so 5P6, almost there, okay, 6S2, okay, then, um, you know, you got to do, you got to come down here and do this block, okay, so I'm just going to jump to 4F14, okay, and then you come back up and you do have this 5D1, but then you got 5D1, 5D2, 5D3, 5D4, so we'll just call that 5D, okay, 4 to get to um, tungsten. So whew, that was kind of a long question. So I guess 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So hopefully 14 is a good answer. Let's see. Almost there. Passed it. Ooh, I'm guessing letter C is a correct answer. So a little bit cumbersome, but boy, once you know the basics of electron configuration, you can pretty much do anything. Okay, um, while we're talking about that one, though, I'm going to go back to it for a minute. Let's say, uh, which I'm going to call it, tungsten was to make a plus two charge. Just an FYI, okay, you got this big, huge electron configuration. What electrons would you remove to make tungsten plus two? Okay, and I know you might be tempted to remove from here, but remember the rule I said, you have to remove from the furthest away energy level. So you got 5D, you got 4F, but here is 6S. Anything in the 6 energy level is further away. So therefore, I'm actually going to remove those electrons. So just be careful because you remove electrons sometimes in a slightly different order than you put the electrons in. Okay? So that's a little bonus information there. All right, two more. 
Question 19 says an element has this electron configuration in the element's photoelectron spectroscopy emission spectrum. The peak that represents which subshell would have the smallest height. So you remember height is how many electrons have that binding energy or in that subshell. So I'm basically looking for the one that has the least amount of electrons. And it looks like this 5D1 is going to be our winner. Okay, so five, it only has one electron in it. So that would be the shortest peak, 5D1. Okay, let's see. Um, number 20, student is studying the properties of an element. The student does research and determines the element's photoelectron spectroscopy emission spectrum shows six distinct peaks. The student proposes a table of ionization energies based on this data. Uh, what is the identi identity of the element uh, that the student is working on? Okay, so six peaks means that we're dealing with 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's three peaks, 3s2. 3p6. So our answer is somewhere in the 3p sublevel. Okay, so if you look in the 3p sublevel on your periodic table, okay, that basically means that one, two, three, these are your possible answers. Okay, so to narrow it down from there, okay, uh, basically I think you really um let's see sorry then from there i feel like i'm missing one um you can look at ionization energies so here's the first one here's the second one roughly doubling but when you get to that third one that is the big jump so this guy has two uh valence electrons okay so i feel like one two three four three has two Three, four, five. Oh, that's why I'm missing a peak. So I lied. It's not in 3P6. Okay. I have to add one more to get to six. So I'm going to go into the fourth, 4S2. So basically that changes things quite a bit. Your answer, I was starting to panic because I wasn't seeing an answer. Your answer has to be one of these two guys. Okay. It's either calcium or it's potassium. Okay. Because that's, uh, that would be basically something in the 4S sublevel would give you your six peaks. Okay. So I think you guys know what the answer is because based on valence electrons, we see that we have two valence, okay? And when you get rid of the third one, it's in the core closer to the nucleus, so it has to be calcium. All right, well, I think that concludes the no-calc practice. Uh, as always, if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to talk to your teacher. All right, thanks for listening. I hope something that you listened to helped. Have a great day.